Good evening and welcome to the Society of Illustrators in this, our fall 1993 National Lecture Series. I'm Joel Iskwich, Lecture Series Chair, and before introducing this evening's guest, I must make mention of a few brief items. Number one, there is no smoking, of course, during the lecture. However, smoking is permitted back at the bar, which you're cordially invited to visit following the lecture. Also, we'd like to make mention of our thanks to Mobile Foundation, whose uh, continued generosity and support has made this educational series possible. Uh, also, I'd like to bring members and guests attention to next week's event uh, when uh, our guest will be John Thompson. That's the 17th of November. Now on to uh, tonight's guest, Mr. Herb Toss. It was, um, while I was involved uh, rather heavily in the paperback field that I first encountered Herb Toss's illustrations. Uh, the cover art for the John Jakes Kent family series uh, was uh, just remarkable in, in, its, uh, in its unusual painterliness in a genre that uh, uh, often, uh, often is given uh, uh, mileage for uh, its 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 reach toward the uh, toward overkill or the hard boiled overstatement. Uh, the work was uh, ex exquisitely painterly. Uh, the brushmanship, uh, the directness of approach, was uh, quite unique and set Herb's work apart. I thought from uh, many of the mainstream in the mass market. Uh, those books sold something in excess of 40 million copies, which is just a staggering, a staggering figure and probably drove the marketing uh, geniuses uh, uh, to distraction. In the uh, considerably less mercantile world of uh, the limited edition book, Herb's work for the Franklin Library uh, sets a, uh, a standard, really, for getting to the heart of the concept without risking uh, the sin of, of over-interpretation. Uh, Herb has always had this gift through the body of his work uh, for, for really distilling a certain kind of purity and a certain kind of honesty and uh, always resulted in a certain type of eloquence. Herb illustrated uh, better than 30 titles uh, for the Franklin Library. The uh, One of the most beloved titles, uh, Isaac Singer's uh, Gimple the Fool, Herb's personal favorite also, uh, earned for him a gold medal from the Society of Illustrators. Herb's uh, has been uh, the recipient of numerous uh, citations, awards of excellence, bronze, silver, and gold medals from the Art Directors Club of New York, the Society of Illustrators, Communication Arts, to name a few, in Herb's, in Herb's own words, uh, his personal work, as he calls it, or his private work, is, uh, is to be found in many of the nation's leading museums and collections. Uh, the United States Department of Interior, uh, the U.S. Air Force Art Collection, Smithsonian Institute, I could go on, I won't. You get the gist. We have a, uh, a wonderful artist with us this evening, and I ask you to join me in uh, giving a warm welcome to Herb Toss. About it. It's not working. Oh, it's not working. It's not working. Don't worry about it. Put it down. Yep. So One less cord. Get it all on. Okay. Herb's working. Do I push this button down or up? Uh, up. Up. Okay. Uh, I hope I get through this. <laughs> and uh, I guess I'll, I'll just start a little at the beginning and. Um, uh, somebody once said that whatever you're looking at as you're eating your breakfast, you know, the cereal box is sort of like molds you. And uh, I grew up in the period when Saturday Evening Post was there, McCall's, and all the magazines were uh, very large. And 
hopefully somebody was looking at them. Um, my first, uh, when leaving high school, I, I got the, uh, this job as an apprentice um, for 18 bucks a week, which I was happy to please to, to, uh, <clears throat> to, to get, frankly. And uh, uh, though in those days, they had large studios. And within those studios, uh, there were letterers, uh, illustrators, uh, retouch people. It was like a department store filled with uh, different uh, artists. Um, stayed there for a while, and um, they, I most of the time spent a lot of my moments um, in the back doing samples, and eventually um, they fired me, <laughs> which then uh, began my my freelance period. <laughs> the first. Um, my first, very first illustration that I sold was to Paget Magazine. Uh, the art director said to me, uh, if I like what you do, I'll give you a hundred bucks, and if, if not, I'll give you 84. <laughs> it wasn't 85, it was 84. Uh, so I did this thing, I delivered it, and he said, okay, send me a bill for $84. <laughs> well, my career was over, and, uh, but about three or four months later, he called back again for another illustration. And again, I was to bill him for $84. This went on for quite a while, until I realized that he must like it if he keeps calling me. And, he finally gave me a hundred bucks. Now, what else am I going to say here? Um, I totally forgot. Can I cheat a little and look at the list? Thanks. Well, one of the things I've, I've always felt as a, uh, an illustrator, uh, there's an illust as an illustration that NCYF did uh, for Treasure Island, which has Peel as a blind man walking, uh, tapping his way in the middle of the night, which I think is one of the best illustrations ever. And uh, in reading the book, there's only this one little sentence describing it, and that he was able to create this whole business is really what I think uh, illustrators are about and should be about, which is uh, not only enhancing uh, the written word, but sometimes, if you can, being better than uh, what they're doing. So uh, with that, I think I'll go to the slides where it's a little safer. <laughs> Sorry. Where's the magic button? No? Help somebody.
Everybody go home. <laughs> oh, oh. There should be a focus on the remote, yeah. Okay. That's focus, right? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I have to introduce you to my family first. This is my mother. And uh, this is done, these are what I call a cardboard series. They're done on cardboard, obviously. Usually the back of a tracing pad or whatever. Am I in trouble here? Okay, sorry. Uh, this is my father, who... Uh, he used to play cards every weekend uh, with my two uncles. Uh, the one I think I'm not supposed to move this thing while I'm talking. Uh, there we go. My uncle on the right, <laughs> who you can't see, smoking the pipe, I could do the alphabet backwards. <laughs> I'm having a problem here. It's, it's by on automatic. Is it on automatic? What? It's on automatic. Yeah. That's what's going on. Thank you. Herb? Herb? Hello. Do you mind uh, yeah. if you sit okay. down on that table right there? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you just sit on there, that would be perfect. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Good. Very Thank much. you. Okay. <laughs> this is much better. Focus? Okay. And my other uncle on the right, he had these two jokes uh, from my father, who was always losing on cards, or if he lost. Uh, one was, uh, Sam, they made the pants too long. My father's name is Sam. And the other one was, even the uh, subways are in the hall. <laughs> these guys, they play for hours. And I think if a big winner was maybe 15 cents or something. This is also involved with Passover, by the way. I really call this thing the Passover plot. And uh, it's hard. I'll, I'll explain it briefly, though. Passover to... No, nah, I won't. It's too complicated. <laughs> it's too complicated. Anyway. Uh, these are... The guy smoking the pipe, uh, my mother's brothers, or my uncle's, He's the one who could do the alphabet backwards. Uh, he worked in a, uh, a flag factory and was in a shipping department, and so the letters were backwards as he walked through, and that's how he could do this thing. <laughs> my, other, my other uncle was a uh, work for a distributor for newspapers and comic books, and so my art career, I think, is based on all those comic books that are in my house. These things, basically, I try to do them as a child would sort of see them. This is my mother, <laughs> and, uh, who really had this kind of uh, great spirit. And I did this bumper car black because, you know, my father-in-law was at that time dying, but she was uh, that kind of person, I mean, who would, you know, do this thing. My father-in-law here, who, as a child, his, his father took them from Europe to Africa to South America and into the States. And so his education was not there, and so he, he would read and uh, he educated himself, basically. And of course he had some fish and uh, a parakeet. This uh, newspaper he's reading, by the way, I, instead of doing all the type, while the paint was wet, I, uh, I think I took a penny saver or something that, and rubbed the back of it so that the type went, uh, became embedded in the paint. Now, this is a more serious attempt of, of doing a uh, the family portrait. 
And uh, it's a very Larry Rivers uh, derivative kind of painting, probably based on uh, the last Civil War veteran, or I think I got that sort of like inspired me to do this. But the reason I'm showing that this thing, that's me in a carriage, uh, is because it lent itself to this, although this, I admit, is a uh, is, uh, what's the word? Well, anyway, it's something I wouldn't do today. I mean, that thing in the, in the right-hand side. But however, I saw a similarity between, while going through the slides for the show, between my personal painting and uh, this particular painting, which, by the way, is Mario, Mario Puzo book, which, which is a damn good book, much considerably better than The Godfather. Um, and that segment there, uh, the building, is a uh, photo colored, uh, painted on. I hate to do buildings in bricks, so I don't know how to do them. Which then led to this series. At least that's what I, how I, I think I came upon this thing. Uh, this series was uh, the Kent Chronicles of John Jake's things. Where when this thing appeared, nobody knew it would take off. They published this thing, and and then they just ran the presses on it. And on the money side of this thing, or the business side of this thing, that there were the series a change. It changed publishers once. The first art director was fired, and so on. I dealt through three art directors each one more nervous than the other because he loved the success of the previous book. Uh, eventually, when they went to television, MCI called me, MCA, wherever they are, called me in to give the rights to the covers for the television thing. But uh, when I walked in there, there was the my art director and the MCA art director who had a Formica top drawing table and I knew I was in a lot of trouble in that room <laughs> and uh, they quoted me this terrible price which I said and which gave them permission to cut up the art and do what they wish with it uh, I left the room, I said, no thanks, and then this went on for months until they threatened to sue me if I didn't release it, which I did, but of course the money became a little better, so considerably better. <laughs> so beware of Formica tops. <laughs> now this, uh, this originally, the way uh, the bombers were up on top. You can see the cut marks in this, the art director. Are you here, George? No, that's good. Uh, he cut this thing apart. And you can see the cut mark on the horizon there and so on. In other words, we're starting off with this one idea and then uh, the type, you know, gets so. But it still looks nice. I still like it. I think it's a nice job. Uh, this is uh, Wave of Destiny, obviously, it has to do with the wave. Uh, it's a romance book, and this is pretty much, I mean, when I'm starting a painting, the, uh, there's a raw sienna corner there, and I sort of like kill all the whites, and that's always pretty much my basic uh, tonality, and then I paint on top of that. Oh, I also forgot to mention, uh, which I should, I guess, that uh, in working for different things, I sort of change. So the paperbacks are mostly photo orientated, but things like uh, uh, Franklin Library are not photo orientated. They're they're memory drawings or from scrap or something. Uh, and this is one of those book covers that is sort of like made up out of nowhere. <coughs> It's an Agatha Christie thing. And this is called The Wolf of, the, of Masada, and it's interesting in that there, for a paperback cover, there aren't 
there isn't a woman in this thing. And uh, in this book, he has one very bad eye, uh, which was gouged out in the battle, and so, <clears throat> which gave me an opportunity to force a real dark area there. Um, this is Bloody Hand, and uh, Western, obviously. And most our illustrators use a photographer called Bob Osanich. And when we do a Western, he has this barrel there. And you put these guys on the barrel, has a saddle on it. And you could see he's still on a barrel, you know. He's not really, he's not really on a horse. Huh? Oh. Oh, thanks. Uh, this is called, this was a Bone of the Century. Nice feedback. Uh, they spent a lot of money on this book, and they had two, two of us do covers, which they then uh, sent, to two, sent to two distributors for uh, their opinion. And one distributor said, uh, I like the silver one, that's the other one. Uh, the people uh, look glamorous and like you're from Hollywood and, and it looks like a dull bestseller. I don't like the orange one, the people are too ordinary looking, etc. The other distributor said, uh, I don't like the silver one, the people look, uh, they don't look real, and it looks like a dull bestseller. <laughs> and so on. Well, they ran with the other one. And it was, it flopped. It stayed on the bestseller list for one week. And the firm, who was overly invested anyway, it was, this was Fawcett, uh, fell. It just collapsed. And uh, I was always grateful that they uh, didn't go with me on this. <laughs> uh, this one is called uh, Flowers in the Blood. It's about uh, opium. India, obviously. Uh, this one is missing. And if you see it anyplace, call me. There's a thing for Simon and & Schuster and, and it disappeared suddenly. This is, they have a line of books that are not uh, top of the line and they mostly go to colleges and they're by authors who are brand new. And so they give you uh, not much money but uh, you can sort of do something more interesting or, or something that's not mass is the word I'm looking for. Now, <clears throat> oh, I, one other thing I forgot to say. I am, I've arranged this show sort of like into books, magazines, personal stuff, portraits, etc. So we're in the book category. This is the first thing I ever did for Franklin Library. It's a farewell to arms. It's a pencil on paper, and his words are sparse. And so I decided to do a drawing that was like his writings. And got more interested in outside shapes or and and things around things instead of describing it. And. Uh, there was a big objection from the people who read that book because it took them quite a while to try and find out what was going on. And even I don't know what's going on when I look at this one. <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> this is the Italians retreating, World War I. And I, I sort of agree, although I love to draw this way and I could spend my life doing it. <clears throat> And th this is uh, from John Steinbeck, uh, Cannery Row, which I thought, you know, is an earthy thing. And, and this is a, uh, so it's in the browns, and this is pastel. Besides, they only gave me two colors anyway, which they usually do. And they usually brown and black, and so when the time they reproduce it, it's mud, uh, as you'll see further on. But I've always loved to draw 
this kind of thing. This is no, there's no description of this guy at all, except that he lived in a boiler. And what does this guy look like? And anyway, this is a, uh, from Crime and Punishment. And editors are always, if there's somebody reading a letter or a book or writing a letter, that's the thing they want you to do. Editors are word orientated and you're always doing this and the people aren't doing anything. They're just looking at this paper. And that's what's going on here. But <laughs> Anyway, he got this letter. It's not a draft notice. He got his mother and, and sister are coming to visit him. And of course, he's a, living in this very poor condition place. These things were done on sepia tone paper. I, I did my own drawing. There are no photographs involved. Uh, and I photographed of the drawing and then used my enlarger and have made this print on sepia tone and then painted on top of the sepia tone. And don't ever try it. It's terrible. <laughs> you put down a wash and the whole thing is gone. I was in such trouble. I called, what's his name? Uh, who wrote the handy, the artist's handy book? Meyer, Mayer. Ralph. Ralph, thank you. Ralph. And Ralph said, uh, try retouch varnish. And it was perfect, absolutely. It looks good, Huh? It looks good. Well, thanks. Uh, this is the uh, crime. Um, now, in this case, the editor who I was doing the book with said, no, she never turns around to see who, who, who's doing this, but uh, we looked it up, and of course, it, she does turn around for just a minute before it comes down on her head. And she was rattled to the entire session throughout this. Here's mom, you know, the one who wrote the letter. And these are some other things from it also. These are, as I say, in, they're all in two colors mostly. Here we go. Well, this is uh, Faulkner's Light in August. Where they, t they uh, uh, strip the uh, this man and take him out and do this thing to him. This, the one on the right, where you, you know, where I get a, uh, where they want you to do, uh, introduce you to two people who are in different parts of the room in a tiny space, so you're either uh, forcing a perspective that is not true for what's going on, either you're top or high, or it's very busy. And so I always, if I get that kind of thing, I sort of like try and use that mirror so that I'm, you're seeing both, both faces, which I feel is very important. More from uh, Light in August. This was uh, Trinity for uh, Franklin. Uh, this was their first edition that was a signed edition that came out at the same time the book came out for mass marketing. And I never got to read the book, that is, while I was doing this, and it was told to me by this editor. And uh, because it was an Irish thing, he felt that it should have heavy blacks throughout. And they were about I don't know how many. We started out with like 35 illustrations to be done in a month. And I convinced them that less is better than more. But I still, it was still about 25 or 26. And it meant doing one a day at least. In some cases, there were two a day going. And these things were just totally made up. There aren't, there was no, no shots or anything. Uh, this is one man against the mob. Same thing. This is oil on paper, so it dries very quickly. And it was sort of like a drip stage then. I was dripping somewhat. And what good is Ireland without a pub scene? 
Oops, sorry. Are those oil or gouache? Yes, they're all oil. Uh, uh, gouache is a early, very early period. It's in the magazine yeah. section. These are Rita's Digest. These are oil pencil on paper. Guy with the beard looks like Ben Wilberg, but it's not. It's also Rita's Digest condensed books, uh, East meets uh, West. They wanted sort of an Isaac Singer thing, but uh, kept getting more involved, and, and it didn't turn out that way. These are on canvas. All the charcoal things are on canvas. He's introducing her Anglo-Saxon to his father. He's busy reading the stock market things. This was a terrific story. I love this. This is for, for the Digest for a special Christmas issue. Made me cry when I read this thing. Uh, their, their son, who was an artist, lived in the city. It's a period piece. Uh, was killed in an auto accident, and uh, when they were told of this, they came out in the middle of the night and planted corn, you know. It was just a remarkable story. This is for Franklin, uh, the Brothers Camaraza pencil paper, which I think is one of the greatest books ever written. They're, the brothers has a story within a story within a story. There are like three brothers, four, and each one has a different uh, see, tells you get involved in each one of those people. Here Jesus comes back, and this is the resurrection. Of course, they throw him in jail. Now this is Isaac. This is Gimple the Fool. Now this is the assignment sort of like I've been waiting for. Uh, I don't know. It was just wonderful when they gave it to me. I had asked them if they did any Isaac Singers, and they said no. And then he won the uh, Pulitzer Prize, and they gave it to me. They originally gave me single pages to do, and I said, I'll give you double page spreads and no charge for the extra page. And they agreed to that. Uh, here he's telling his wife the news. He's leaving for America, and so he's doing that. This is the lead story, Gimple the Fool. Gimple works in a bakery, and he's, very, he's a very simple-minded uh, fellow, and everybody makes fun of him. And he's sleeping here in the back of the, uh, the bakery, sleeping on burlap bags or what have you. And uh, the devil comes, or a representative of the devil comes, and says, tells him, he said, I think you should urinate in the bread and get even with everybody. But Gimple does not do this and eventually inherits the bakery. So if you ever read Singer, you'll know that he deals with heaven, hell, uh, funny things, and man's right and wrong. He's terrific. He's the only man I know who could start, still start a story with uh, Once Upon a Time. This was called The Fainter, and uh, it's too crazy to explain this one. This one here, his wife uh, leaves on a holiday, and he's trying to make out with the maid, that's the lady with the broom, and she's trying to seduce him, but she doesn't want to make it that obvious. <laughs> and so he makes, a, he makes a midnight call on her, and she chases him with the broom out, and he keeps doing this, and finally he gets admitted into the bed. But things turn badly for him. He leaves with her, and his business collapses, and miserable. So, stay away from the maids, I guess. I'm not sure. This guy visits all the synagogues, and he's really talking about food here. He's describing carrots and things, and because everyone's hungry here. Some of these faces are big-time rabbis on the left side there. And this is Isaac Singer. When they brought this to him, 
you know, Isaac has a pointy ear, and he has a line down his head that goes like this. And he looked at this and he said, I may look like the devil, but why advertise? <laughs> I took, so he made me imagine a vanity. I never thought Isaac would do that. But I had to take out this line and hide his ear. You can almost see the point on it, though. And this is uh, all on paper for the call, a John Hershey book. That's uh, my name in Chinese uh, after a visit. And to make it look more authentic there. And they wanted, uh, they didn't, the sculling scene was very important, and they wanted this house up there, but I felt that if I ended the landscape or the seascape or whatever and put this building up, I, I slowed down the thing. So I reversed the process and, and sort of made a subliminal reflection and it got by. And these were done sort of like two thirds of the way there and uh, which I don't normally do for them, and then uh, I worked on it some more. This guy, uh, Anglos were called uh, long noses in China, and uh, when this goldfish sees his long nose, it does this flurry, in which made these two guys giggle. I try to do these like Chinese prints, and of course, there's always the rice bowl scene, uh, in, in that period. And here they're being uh, taught uh, Chinese, or, uh, which is part of the missionary work, I mean, to teach people to read and, and uh, write. And this was a Ferber uh, uh, short story. And my original idea, I had the shade up and I was doing all of the buildings and the windows and uh, the fire escapes and laundry to sort of make it look like music. But it got too involved and too busy and so I, I just pulled the shade down on this thing. And this is the last piece I did for them. This is a, uh, what's his name? Philip Roth, thank you. Uh, book and Michael Mendelssohn, the art director, is way over there. That's my gift to him on the on the on the right side. That is the art director of uh, Franklin Library. This is the writings of Karl Marx, and I got interested in uh, in sculpture. I did this in plastiline. I delivered the job to the art director in a little box of photographs, which he didn't care for. Um, I think he wanted it for his basement, but it fell apart anyway, so nobody got it. This thing was done in such a rush uh, that when they photographed it, it it's terracotta. It looked like it looks like sand, which is sort of nice. This was a lot of fun. This day for me uh, doing this. These two guys I had trouble with it until I decided that they both should be saying the same thing. Well, this is my first magazine piece from a call, which is ancient. Uh, it's the first one they bought, and I had done it previously three or four years before, it had a blue sky and green grass. And I uh, glazed it with the yellow. Anyway, that didn't do a damn thing for me. But this one did change my life. And, uh, this one underneath is, is designer colors, on top of that is oil, and on top of that is pastel. I really didn't know what I was doing there. But this one piece got me a contract in, with the British magazines, and, and I really learned a lot working uh, with them. It was like you were doing 14-part serials, 8-part serials. And it was a great education uh, trip-wise also. The calls. 
this was done sort of like uh, the Franklin Library things where I did it three quarters of the way through and then uh, finished it up. This is for uh, a guidepost and uh, I actually thinned down the paint quite a bit so that it broke up in particles and it gave me a snow effect without having to do all the snow. Also guidepost, the original concept of the, art, of the art director was to be inside the train, and uh, which I thought was didn't work, and did this thing from the outside. This is uh, a story about a young alcoholic for guidepost also. Guidepost, guidepost was very important to us at that time because, you know, if you're hungry, and you're not working, and then suddenly uh, guidepost calls, it's, you know, it's more than just earthly. <laughs> uh, this is for uh, a Japanese uh, bartender's calendar. They use six Americans and six Japanese artists, and they give you the name of the drink. You're not supposed to do the drink, but you can do its ingredients. This was called uh, Royal Cafe. And uh, it takes a while, I think, for it to come on through. This is Charlie Dickens. Uh, now we're getting into uh, my portrait thing. This is Joan, Joan's house. This is Robin. Uh, this is a, my daughter, but I did it when she was older, but I still wanted that sense of uh, childhood. And uh, so I put each one of them has this painting with this braid coming down the side. Well, this woman is a uh, musician type, and so I try to get some music in the, in the piece. And these two people... As I started this painting, I had, it seemed to me I had three paintings here. I had her standing on this side, I had the darkness inside the barn, and I had him. And they weren't, weren't connected until I used that device of putting in the rags there, or drapes, or whatever they are. And they had two lives. One was on the farm, which I represented with oh, the new tree, and he like to go boating. Uh, they had another house on the lake, and so I opened up the inside of the barn with sky and some water. Uh, this woman here uh, is a sex therapist, and she didn't pose this way. I mean, I took this thing off. It's a Gustav Klimt kind of thing, which is part of what she is. Now, one thing I want to say about gilding, I don't know if anybody's ever done that, but it's a, uh, it's sort of like you take this gilder's brush, you rub it in your hair, and you pick up a piece of gold, like so big, one leaf that's worth a couple of bucks, and you pick it up like that, and you bring it over to the canvas. The canvas, any place you want that gold to be on, you put a size on, and it has to be at a certain, it has to be, it can't be dry and it can't be wet, it has to be tacky, it's a very... Anyway, you're bringing this over and someone comes across the room and sneezes. <laughs> and that gold just crumbles up and it's gone, absolutely gone. <laughs> so, also the gold will pick up anything that's underneath that canvas, a hair, uh, it's, it's just incredibly thin. And this portrait is 8 by 11 feet. It's life size. It might even be bigger than life. It was one of these things, you did the drawing, you did the drawing, you tacked it up on the wall, and, and then you stretch the canvas, and you're out of the studio. I mean, it just took over <laughs> the whole place. And you're painting here, and it's vibrating here. It's was, I don't know how those guys did this. Uh, 
This took me months to do. It kept changing. She really has short hair. Kept getting longer and longer and longer. <laughs> I painted her nude first. I saw that really startled the natives up there. But then I thought that's not right. And so, but anyway, see that chop on the side in the lower left. Uh, if you, some of the other ones, you can tell by the size. I mean, in relationship to the other paintings, that this is really really large. This is uh, Wendell Miner, our past president. He's lucky I didn't uh, put a shine on his head. <laughs> <laughs> this is my brother-in-law. He's an accountant. <laughs> you do. It's a payback for all the, all the forms he ever did and lied for me. And he loves these, he wears the red suspenders, they're his mark. And this is sort of like what I'm doing now. Uh, this is a nice book. Do you want to, I mean, but I'm this kind of thing. This is uh, my first piece for National Geographic. This is uh, Pisario. When they called me, I thought they wanted me to renew my subscription. <laughs> anyway, it's really a thrill of work for them, it is. I mean, this is really, you know, a lot of fun, a lot of sweat. This is, uh, this hasn't come out yet. This is Simone Bolivar. Uh, this is March sometime. Uh, he recruited, he had a real ragtag, I mean rag, you know, kind of funny army. And some of the natives that had this very long lance, extremely long, against the Spanish who had shorter lances. And uh, so they won the day, and it's and mostly because of the, the long lance. And this is them coming over the Andes uh, to get behind them. And here Simone is dying, it's his death moment. And uh, this is the Cherokees. <laughs> that uh, it's called the uh, March of the T Tears, or something like that. Thank you, Trail of Tears. Uh, which may not run or may run, we don't know yet. We're having trouble yet. I've been paid, but uh, we have, there's, there are all technical problems. Anyway, and this is my private kind of thing here. This one really didn't work out, but my idea was to have this dog cast the, sh the long shadow uh, so that who is leading who, this, this little dog or this, you know, this little white dog or this guy, but it never, I, I don't think it came across. And this was a... Uh, environmental piece. So pack up your newspapers. And this is my dog. And I have to read this poem. <laughs> I had this dog, his name was Spot, and he was clever as could be. See Spot run and see Spot sit. He stayed in my studio to watch me paint and he learned to mix flesh, grass, and sky until he became better than I. He learned to trace to my disgrace, barking incessantly in my face, of computers and faxes, press type 2. Ballpoint pens and all natural orange juice concentrated. Shot him dead, I did one day. <laughs> Painted him on my canvas stretch. Miss him not too badly, you might say. That is how I won my medal. What the hey? See spot run and see spot play. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, this one is called My Mother's Wedding Dress.
And this is me in the studio <laughs> with all these people. And that's it. Thank you. Oh, there's Mark. Thanks. We shut this off now. Hello? Anybody? Thanks. Yeah, it's done. Can we ask questions? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks. Any questions, Ben? <laughs> no? My question. The one you have there? Yeah. Yeah, it's oil and cardboard. I don't recommend it because the uh, cardboard is high acid, and uh, those things really aren't going to be there. And uh, no, that well, it's a, uh, it's a, such a slow deterioration process. Actually, I did my father first. I couldn't handle my mother till later because most of these things are done after they're gone, uh, and uh, so. She got done last, even though she went first. But, uh, uh, but my father's painting is sort of losing color. I, I sense that. You haven't seen it. Lautrec did all this stuff on cardboard. And yeah, I know he had been around a long time. He had better material. <laughs> <laughs> looked pretty cheap. Looked like laundry boards. Well, it was corrugated board. Yeah. 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 Uh, but when you see those, I think they keep them under low light. They don't really give it a full blast. Yeah. So I have a sense that they're very fragile <clears throat> also. It's a good surface to work on. Beca well, because it's a dry surface, if you like that. It's a nice uh, neutral tone. Oh, uh, yes. It's, it's, yes. No matter whatever you're going to put down, it's going to pop out there. Yeah. It, it's, it's so true. And they're small, which is also, I mean, these other things are big. So you can really get a good brush in there. Are there any, uh, besides the Singer books that we were talking about, are there any books that you would really love to do as, as personal projects for you, aside from the ones that you, you've done? Any favorites that you might want to try? Well, actually, no, 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 no. My, my, my reading actually came, or my, from working with them, uh, set me on books I would never touch. I mean, Crime and Punishment, I had heard so much about it, just frightened me you know, to even open that book. And then all those Russian names, everybody has three names. <laughs> um, but uh, frankly, I haven't read anything recently. There are parts of things, like I'm just reading, uh, when I can, Madame Bovary, I'm a little late on it. But there's a scene in there, there's a wedding scene, and there's a fiddler in the foreground with uh, things hanging, and there was a whole group of people winding through a pastor that just, I, I have it on my list, doesn't mean I'll do it. I have a long list, actually, of things. There's another, uh, actually, uh, uh, Love in the Time of Kaya was, is a great book. It has it filled with, uh, I know I slaughtered that last word, but uh, it has great images, and there's at least five or six of things that I wanted to do in it. So, He's really a wonderful author. I'm just curious if I can. Uh, how do you how do you plan out your whole uh, working uh, year, so to speak? I mean, do you fit personal projects in between commission work, or do you try? Yeah, to it's dangerous time? because you're doing them when you're hungry. I mean, when you're not working. Um, now I'm older. I mean, I have my car. I have my house, you know, my dog is dead, I don't have to feed him. <laughs> and uh, so things are different with me. And I'm older, and I'm, I don't have as much energy, and I don't want to. Uh, so 
I, but things take longer for me to do, frankly. Now I'm working. I work bigger now, uh, especially those charcoal drawings. Those things are really big. Uh, if they have a little, have little faces, you, you know, you have to work big. They're on canvas. Yes, they are. Okay. Hello. What kind of paper do you use when you work with the oil? Oh, it's a terrible paper. It's a ledger. I think it's 32 pound. It's a great surface for drawing. It has a sheen. Of, it's high acid though. Uh, you do your drawing, then spray the hell out. You know, on top of it, and then paint on top of that. Otherwise, you'll lose it. You'll lose everything immediately. And you can't work it too much though. You know, you've got like maybe two and a half shots on it. After that, the paint is just picking up. So, uh, and you can see on some of them, they have this bubbly thing. That's the paint that's being distressed. It's just time to leave it, you know. So. Why wouldn't you work on an illustration board? Um, be tell out of me. Because I like to draw on the paper. Uh-huh. Uh, because those are things aren't there are there there are no projections. I mean those are straightforward. And the illustration board I've never cared for. Mm -hmm. I thought a grain was it just didn't I don't know, it didn't feel right with the, I've done some, but it's not as comfortable as the ledger for me. It's a cheap paper, but I mean we're may, you're mainly concerned with meeting your deadlines and you yeah and uh, you're not keeping them. I mean that's my concern anyway. What drew you to using uh, the charcoal on a canvas surface? Well, no, no, well, I thought, well, there were two reasons. One is that I, I tried to do those drawings as biblical as I could. And the other thing was that I woke up one day and I was drawing and uh, I couldn't pick up the paper, the texture of the paper. I had lost a sense of feeling in my, my, with these two fingers, this finger, and you and I, I was in a terrible sweat. I mean, you can't find the paper, you can't draw. I mean, that's how it was with me. And uh, so I needed a more tactile thing, and so I picked up the charcoal and the, and the canvas. And it's really just, uh, what is it? It's deposits on the, you know. On the, on the nerves. And, uh, but I've learned a little bit. I can draw now, you know, without that. But then it was a terrible problem. Well, Do you prepare your canvas with anything specific for the charcoal? Uh, no. Some canvases reject charcoal totally. It's really hard. And so sometimes I bathe it down with uh, turpentine. I'm not saying that'll help. I do use a canvas that's called number 113 at New York Central that accepts charcoal. And um, it's probably the only one I have. It's, a Winsor Newton used to make one, but it isn't made anymore and I can't find it. And this was the best substitute I could make. It's linen, right? It's linen, yes. And you don't have to do any, Ben. I, I have another question. Yeah. You, you said, you have nerve damage? Yeah, I do. Take vitamin Bs, right? In your, in your in your hands and feet? No, just my, just my hand. One hand. One hand, this hand, the right hand, of course. It's, it's, um, what are they? Just pressing on my spine. I mean, I, that's one theory. I have x-rays taken, and uh, I also have tennis elbow. I don't play tennis. <laughs> 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 Do you use a lot of fixers? No. I don't have your disease, Ben. Okay. <laughs> okay. Have a drink on me. No. <laughs> Thanks for coming.